Hey everybody, it's Christy, the homeschool teacher next door. And today we're going to talk about how we are dealing with homeschool burnout. Oh man, it is January 25th and oh, it is rainy here in West Georgia. I can, you probably can hear it on the tin roof we've got. And it's just bleh. <laughs> so I think um, burnout for everybody, and don't forget, you can download my handy dandy notes and print them out in the show notes there, and so you can keep up with me and such. But let's talk about what is burnout. Ugh, burnout, it is back to reality yadas. You know, it's after Christmas, the decorations are down. You know, the Christmas tree's been put away. All of the news wore off the toys. We go back to school, and it's the same old books we left in. Blech. <laughs> At least in August, we get new books to look in, right? And so we go back. There's nothing to look forward to anymore. Everything outside is cold. It's dark. It's dreary. I mean, it's just, you know? So it's a very normal Thing. And everybody I know that is a student or is a teacher or mentors kids or even people who are completely kid-free in their life, everybody's dealing with a little bit of, uh, you know, back to reality itis because it's a long time till spring break. But yo, dig in, we can get to it. So what can we do about it? Or as my doctor would say, what is our treatment plan? <laughs> he will circle treatment plan. What is our treatment plan for this? As you know, Mama Wolf is Appalachian. I am from the northwest Georgia corner right there where the foothills come down. And uh, so my family immigrated from, they were like the Scott-Irish immigrators, immigrators and such. And we were taught uh, by our grandmothers that sometimes in life the only thing you can do is just simply clean your house. You know what? Because you're going to have to live in your house a lot when it gets cold, you know? And so clean it up really good, change it, freshen it up, move your furniture around, you know? And just because sometimes the only thing you can change is the inside of your home. So if you're working out something or whatever, this is an Appalachian, Scott Irish, well, this is what our grandmothers told us when we were growing up. And uh, I grew up and called it home economics. <laughs> right after my son, when we got back to this black time of the year, uh, that's what we did. After we moved, uh, after we cleaned up all of the stuff from Christmas, um, we moved around the furniture, we swept up the floor, we vacuumed, we washed the walls, we mopped. Uh, I mean, we turned on the music, we had some loud angry girl rap music, you know, we had the baby driver soundtrack. I mean, just whatever does it for you. And we cleaned up the crap out of this house. And it was awesome. And while we were doing that, we took everything off the walls. Uh, sometimes we would rearrange things on the wall because if you move around furniture, sometimes what you had behind that on the wall needs to be moved anyway. And so, I mean, all of that got done up. Um, the United States Navy has a thing they call cleaning stations. Holy smoke. Yes, everybody that's ever been deployed with the U.S. Navy just went, oh, God, cleaning station. <laughs> but, yeah, and cleaning stations, it's really a neat thing. They uh, come over the loudspeaker, and they're like, turn on the music, turn on everything, and just, you know, get down on it, and just, you pick up something to clean, and you just sit there, and you clean it until they tell you that cleaning station's over, and it actually is so that when people go to battle stations, they stay focused at the battle station, because, let's face it, yeah, we're at battle stations, we need to stay on high alert, but hey, you may not wonder, but if you had doing cleaning stations, your brain ain't gonna wonder as bad. How can you put cleaning stations into your house? Navy vets are going to be going, Ah! These children have been through enough. Don't do it. <laughs> do it. Ten minutes, twenty minutes of cleaning stations. Everybody just cleaning everything that they can find. Just find something clean it up. You'd be amazed at what that does to your house. Cleaning stations, y'all. Uh, put new art on the walls. Uh, put up new posters. Uh, 
um, a lot of times my son and I, we would start a new subject this time of year. So we would take a whole wall and we would put up posters for that, like new posters and such. Um, if you work at a desk, freshen it up. Um, put a new poster board down on your workspace. This is something that is an old art school thing. Um, we're taught in art school when you, uh, well, I can just show you. <laughs> we're taught in your drafting table to take and put yourself a piece of poster board and tape it down to protect the top of it. But it also gives you a place that's kind of yeah, soft to write. So here, there's my lunch, here at my workstation, or at my computer, or at my desk, whatever, you see that I've got it here too. And it just creates a nice place for you to, just a nice place for you to uh, take and put your um, pen down, make some notes and whatever, because, I mean, let's face it, how often do you get one piece of paper? And they found that if you had something soft to write on, like right here, uh, you would grab just one piece of paper because you had something soft to set it down and write on it. It's interesting. And then every so often, just take and refresh them and just go buy you another one or flip this one over. And this is actually what I did with this one. I flipped it over. But you can make all kinds of notes on it. And you probably saw when I gave you the little preview that I have a big circle on mine and that's so that when I videotape things that are on my computer I know where to sit the uh, the TV jig that I put in there so I can film the trail cam videos and stuff that's exactly where it sits uh, clean up your drawers and organize clean up them drawers <laughs> clean up your drawers and reorganize your stuff. Seriously, have pens, pencils, memory cards, phone chargers, index cards, highlighters all in the top drawer. Maybe a bag of Skittles. Oh, now that is some good advice. Mm. I'm devastated. I've ate all my Skittles. <laughs> workbox systems. Oh my goodness, I love a workbox system. Back when uh, we lived in the, uh, on the other side of Atlanta, um, this was the hot stuff. And all of the homeschool mommies, we'd get together on the playground. And as our children were over there, you know, having their Lord of the Flies moment, we were sitting around and we were talking about our work boxes. Hey, what are you using for your work box? How did you decorate it? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> work boxes. Oh, this is so great, and it is not my brainchild, obviously, and it is, I don't even know who cooked this up, but um, you can go on Pinterest, you can Google it, and it's Workbox, and basically, you get a, uh, a box per every subject that you're doing with your child, and you put everything in that box for that subject, okay? So, like, for example... In your math box, you're going to have your math textbook, a notebook, a pencil, maybe two to do your math, erasers, any math manipulatives, a calculator, you know, whatever you're using in your math class. And, you know, like for literature, you can have your textbook, the book that you're studying, your notebook, a pen to write with. Always include something to write with and such because the idea that you're doing is you are providing this box, it has everything your child needs to do that subject, even the doggone pen. There's no reason they need to get up out of that seat. They grab that box, they sit down, here's an index card, that's usually how I did it, is I put an index card on the front telling my son what I wanted him to do for the week. And the reason I would do per week rather than per day, because sometimes he would do a whole week's worth of that work right there. And that was totally fine. Um, let's see, um, online classes, absolutely, make a box for that too, uh, because there's still things that you need when you're taking a class online. Um, I'm taking uh, drum lessons right now online, and so all of my printouts and all of my notes and stuff like that, they go into a little binder that I have, and I put it over here, Next, it's actually on my uh, music thing and such. But, you know, that's perfect stuff for a work box.
Um, through the years, we use different things. In elementary school, we use like 12 plastic shoe box size box. I think we went to like the Dollar Tree or something and got them. And so the shoe box size boxes that are made out of plastic, and then we just simply put them on a shoe rack. So they were kind of sitting like that so you could see what was in the box. Um, in middle school, we used eight magazine holders. They were like the little cardboard ones that you would get from Ikea. And my son had a bookshelf and he would just put all of his stuff in there. And that was nice because he would also go to this co-op where he had to take maybe three or four of those subjects. So he would take the subject, the whole box, off of his, off of his shelf and just set it down in a rolling box cart that he had and just put a lid on it. It was, it was great. So, um, and then in high school, um, most of his stuff he was doing online at that point. So he put a crate right there in that place on his um, shelf and he had hanging folders in that crate. And that's how he did his work box. Mm. But it's good stuff. And it was funny because any time that we went away from doing not using work boxes, we never got anywhere close to that done. It's good stuff. Pinterest is full of great ideas on work boxes and work box systems. Give that a look. Um, another reason that I would give my son everything he needed to do within a week, sometimes it was throughout a month, is because he really liked doing what is called block scheduling. So that means that the majority of his day he's working on something, and like one subject. Now my son, he's an engineer, he loves doing stuff like that, so a lot of days it would be that. He was working on an engineering project or something, uh, 3D printers, uh, he makes prosthetics. Uh, the uh, Facebook group right now has a banner of a 3D printed prosthetic. That's one he has done. And pretty cool stuff, huh? But you know, you, you really need more time than like 45 minutes a day to work on that. Now there are some subjects that you really need to hit every day like your math, uh, your science, no, no, I'm sorry, not your science, but your math, uh, a foreign language, things like that you need to stay familiar and in practice with. And that's not going to cut it, just doing a whole week-long lesson and then go back and, you know, you need to practice. And music, music's another one. You need to practice that every day. I need to be practicing my drums, but we ain't talking about me. Mm. This also is great for a big new pro a new big project. I knew that sounded funny. Do you know that when you stack um, adjectives in English, you're supposed to put them in alphabetical order? Because it sounds more correct when you say it. Like this, for example. Great for a new big project is what I've written in my notes. But that don't sound correct, does it? Great for a big new project. How about a big and new project? Interesting. Tackle something bold like a science fair project. I mean, come on. Science fair is going to be here before you know it, kids. <laughs> Don't call me up at 1130 the night before and say, Hey, what can I do for the science fair before tomorrow? Pick out what you're going to wear to go and support your friend because you ain't going to be in it. <laughs> um, some homeschool groups that we have been members of before have had things that were a history fair project. This was really interesting because it was just like a science fair, but instead of you making the big poster and you studying it, it was like uh, about a concept or something. Wow, the rain is really coming down now. Um... I'm going to turn off my heater. Um, because when you um, go and you study so much about science and you make these big poster boards and stuff, and then um, you can also do that with a history subject like a person or an event in history. And that's what they would use this for, and they'd get everybody together, and we just had a big history class because it was a history fair of all these different events and people. It was fantastic. If you're up for something really bold, let your student pick a subject and then teach it to you. 
Our eighth grade science teacher did this, and it is so true. You learn so much by turning around and teaching it to somebody else. And this was so much fun. Let me tell you, my son lived grading my papers. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> F minus. <laughs> so, um, in third grade, some of the big things that we tackled, now let me be very clear. My son is like Sheldon Cooper. He's very, very smart. Um, but in the third grade, he wanted to learn more about physics. And so I am not going to try to pronounce this man's name because with my Appalachian accent, mm, but his name is right here. And I think that's spelled correct, correctly. I'll double check. But his books are amazing. And now get me, don't get me wrong. They're not written on a third grade reading level. And that's the reason why I had to read it to my son. And he sat there next to me, just all curled up, you know, drinking his juice box and eating his little fruit things. And while I read to him the physics of the future and intro to super string and M theory. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck am I even saying? And he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know if he knew what I was saying either. But, uh. um, in the fourth grade, we decided to tackle Korean. <laughs> I'm going to say, yo, <laughs> it was great. Um, in the fifth grade, we tackled Hamlet because I was like, eh, I never studied Hamlet. The whole time I was in school, I managed to miss that one. I got uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, and uh, really that was it. But I never got Hamlet, so I really wanted to study that one. So we did it in the fifth grade, and we read it. We memorized the first soliloquy. Soliloquy. <laughs> Appalachian people can't talk. The soliloquy. Yeah, we read. We memorized that there first soliloquy. <laughs> and then we memorized Hamlet's famous soliloquy of uh, "To be or not to be," because um, there's actually several in that book. And the first one is uh, some advice that a father has given to his son before he leaves. Very good stuff. Um, we watched the play that stars David Tennant on YouTube. Oh, that is like the best. I mean, that was the only thing I ever seen with Hamlet, but I really liked that one because it was kind of a modern kind of spin, but it wasn't too modern. And he really nails the whole thing up. Is it crazy? Is he pretending to be crazy? Or is he really crazy? So, I mean, it's good. It's really good. Um, Udemy has online classes. We've taken a lot from them. And you can do it at your own pace. You Like we were talking about block scheduling, where you sit down and do drumming for the rest of the day. You know, whatever you want to do. Um, the prices are very reasonable. And if you catch them on a sale, they're even more better. That's English, y'all. More better. Um, personally, we've taken drumming. That was me. Violin, that was him. Drawing, that was me. German, that was me. Japanese, that was him. <laughs> Dog psychology, <laughs> that was River. And several more. And they were really good. Um, so I recommend those. Um, also, if you would like to learn American Sign Language, you can do so for free uh, at lifeprint.com. Uh, Dr. Bill Vickers is a proud deaf man, and so he tells you all about the culture of the deaf as well as the sign language and such. And I think y'all know that I have a deaf dog. She's over here having her a nap. And so, but yeah, you can learn sign language and then come and tell my dog she's cute. Hers a beautiful girl. And uh, <clears throat> shameless plug, she also has her own book on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to do some art lessons or your child wants to do some art lessons oh my dog Aaron Blaze he is a former Disney artist and he has online lessons his whole website is awesome sauce awesome sauce check it out and he runs sales every so often but man let me tell you right now the classes I have got on sale led me to get the full blown rip roaring full price classes because they're just that good. Yeah. Um, and of course, here's another idea. Learn a new instrument.
Maybe you want to learn a new language. Um, there's all kinds of apps that'll help you with this. In fact, Mango Languages, if you live in the state of Georgia and have a Pines Library card, you already have a subscription to this. You just got to log in and use it. Uh, Duolingo, I really like that too. <laughs> if you have a student that's interested in joining the military, hmm, this would be something interesting for them to do. The United States Navy has a Adobe PDF file of their basic military requirements textbook online. They also have just about every other book that they use for learning, and so they use that there for learning. <laughs> they have all these other books and such that they use in all of their courses online you just have to google and look up uh for them and but this is the exact same literature and the same books that they use if you join the actual big boy grown-up navy um the other branches of service probably have something similar but i'm not 100 percent sure i'm just familiar with the navy side of it uh i would con if it's something you're interested in and you've already because you know by the time that you have decided which branch of service you're interested in, you know, you, you're pretty hardcore into it. So what I would do is I would just contact your local recruiter and ask them if they would recommend what they would recommend your student to do. Uh, in different areas and states and territories, there are unit there are ROTC programs that will give your student a, a as real as you can get to it military experience. Uh, before they sign, and you also get school credit for it. Next subject, read, read, read some more. Read all the time. Read, 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 read. <laughs> and let's face it, it's wet, it's cold, it's gross, it's blah. What else is there to do? Wrap yourself up in a blanket and just sit down and read. I have got so many books that I need to read that, oh, I've gotten so many people that have sent me their books, and I'm so, so grateful. My art teacher, uh, John Turner, I've got one of his books. Uh, a real good friend of mine, Pamela Jones, has written another book, but she wrote it under another name, so i got to get into that one because I can't wait because her first book, When in Rome, was, ah! and so, ah, I just can't even wait. So I need to get into that. But yeah, read, read, read. And um, we were talking about apps. I know this is skipping down this list a minute. But do you have the Libby app? Libby. Libby. Libby is an app that is a gateway into your public library system. I'll let that sink in. Yeah. So the library has got all this stuff digitally now. So you can go and you can be sitting on the, on the sofa, scratching your dog and go, what's going on in psychology today? And you download it. It's there. I'm like, wow, what a time to be alive. And then you read it and you go, mm-hmm. I knew that woman crazy. Mm-hmm. Verified she crazy. And then you're like, okay, I already read this whole thing. And then you send it back. Pfft, never. I didn't even have to get up off the sofa. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right. Now, getting back to the list. Um, back in our elementary homeschool days, um, we would do book fort days. And this was like today where it's rainy and it's gross and it's, you know, and such. But you still had to do school. Yeah. Um, so what we did is we built a fort. We took all the sofa cushions off. We got... Uh, all the top sheets and some clothespins and everything. And my son and I just built the most elaborate fort. And as long as he was reading, the fort stayed up. And he could just stay in the fort all day and read. And, I mean, I wasn't hard, you know, about it and such. And tell him, no, you got it. But, no, as long as he was reading, it stayed up. So, that was a lot of fun because who don't like doing a fort, you know? Even my little reading nook kind of has a little fort presence to it, because <laughs> it's in the closet. <gasps> Can you see Oscar Mayer's little face right there? Oh, Oscar, you're so sheepy. I'm such a good boy. Let's see. Read alouds, y'all. 
I love read alouds in school. Oh, I still love read alouds, but they call it audiobooks when you get grown. Oh, I love it. And you can get audiobooks all over the place. They're great. Um, build a book tower. This is something my son and I did one year, and every time we read a book, um, we would um, write down the name of the book, and we would tape it to the wall. And so, ideally, it was like you just did this side of the book, and we would go, all right, I read that, and then you would write down the name of the book, and you hang it on the wall. You know, and so we had a big stack of them like this. I mean, this is a blank book that my sons gave me for Christmas. But I would. I would take and put it down like this. And I go, rink, rink, war and peace of mom's life, you know. And then we would cut it out and we'd tape it to the wall. So by the end of the year, we had this huge tower of all the books that we had read. And how thick these books were. And it was pretty groovy. It was a moment for all of us. Mm. Um, have your student pick the book that y'all are going to read. You know, I was really surprised. After we finished homeschooling, uh, my son and I both graduated in um, 2022. And um, I was really surprised at how many books he was asked to read that were the same books I was told to read. You know, I just, I don't get down with that. And so the requirements I had for my son in reading in high school was read a banned book. Read two books, if not three, of someone of a different race and our culture and our religion. Because you know... That is like the most powerful thing you can do is read something through somebody else's eyes. Wow. Wow. Good stuff. And then the other book I had him read was um, Extreme Ownership by the U.S. SEALs uh, or a couple of the Navy, new, the Navy SEALs. And that basically saying you're going to screw up in life when you do just own it. You know, and that's what we required in our literature program at home because I felt like that was more beneficial than things that he would read that he wasn't really interested in. And he just told me, you know, he just read them because I told him to, you know. And so I wanted him to read something that he would fall in love with, but with a broad enough scope of such that I could, um, that it would keep his attention. Does that make sense? Okay. So... That's where I'm at with that. Just, you know, we read the same books in school, and I get it. There, There's, you know, banned books and such, but hmm. go to your local library. They're open. Did you know that? <laughs> um, another thing uh, with, uh, I've already done a video on this, and it's talking about how we study books that are pretty hard to study. And I'll be honest with you. I think I I study every book. That's mine. I don't write in books that don't belong to me. But I tend to buy my books at the thrift store or at the libraries like where they take them off the shelf sales. Uh, and every once in a while I'll get one off of Amazon. But I grab it and I read with a pen. Actually, it's not this pen. I don't have it. But it is a four color pen. Because every one of these colors are color coded for or for my notes, um, like red is something that I want to look up. Um, you know, blue is like my personal commentary, whatever. And I've done a whole video on it. Uh, it's in this links, so check it out. Altered book videos and how to pull the teeth of something very hard. Oh, and of course, a shameless plug for my books. Just go to Amazon and search for Christy Bender. But make sure you look at Deaf Dog. <laughs> I also have one called The Drag Queen Cockroach of Atlanta. Whoo! Yeah, it's just that good. One of the things I did uh, when our son was younger in elementary school is we studied the human body, but on big paper. And so uh, we had some wrapping paper left over from Christmas, so I had him lay on it. 
like I flipped it over. I had them lay on it and I drew his outline. So we cut them out and then we hung up the pretty side of it on like the closet door in the room that we were using for our dedicated classroom. You don't have to have a dedicated classroom. We just did back when he was in elementary school because we had a larger house than we have now. And so he, here he is, you know, it's like Batman wrapping paper. And then we would study the brain. And then he would draw his brain and he'd stick it there. And then we'd draw, you know, we would study the heart. And he'd draw the heart and he stuck it there, you know. And all of those things. And as we studied more and more, you know, he got more body parts put to it. And there's a million resources for this. Um, I think we probably had like a book that had all of this stuff already laid out. But there's a million resources for that. So just, you know, get creative. Of course, we had sunglasses. We had like spiky hair. We had like a, <laughs> like a clown thing. It was great. Oh, my goodness. Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Lap books. I love lap books, and I actually have some that I'm going to do a whole series on, but for right now, uh, just follow that link and see what a lap book is, and basically, you get a file folder, and you fold it up a funky way, and you do a lot of little manipulatives with whatever subject you're studying. And then, as you finish the manipulatives, you cut them out, and you glue them onto that a file folder that you have been up a funky way. So it's an art thing and it's a keepsake, but it's also, there's a lot of work that goes into those things. And the kids love it because they've made it their own. And uh, my student is grown and gone, but I still have all of his lap books. He, oh, this is so cute. <laughs> but Pinterest, Teachers Pay Teachers, all of those websites, they've got lap books for every subject. Just go and Google Say you're studying the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome's lap book. Um, and then, of course, keep it fun. Take a, take a page out of the public school system at this time of year. Because they're dealing with this, too. Have a pizza party. That's a good way to break it up. Have an egg drop. If you've got a, somebody that's got a house that's got a balcony where you can throw an egg off and do the egg drop thing, go for it. You know, get a bunch of your friends together. Do it. Um, have a game day. Go hiking. Go study something outside. Uh, we're going to study fungi and mushrooms soon. I'm videotaping a class on that right now. Uh, one of the most fun things that we ever did with our homeschool group is we had a blow things up day. <laughs> Don't alert Homeland Security. It wasn't anything like really terrible. The worst thing we had was Tannerite, and there were professional rednecks dealing with that. But there's a lot of science experiments that a lot of, that some parents will shy away from because they don't want to make a mess in their house. And I get that. You know, we microwaved a bar of ivory soap. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Do it. That bar of soap swells up bigger than that microwave. It's like, yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. Your microwave smells really clean for several weeks afterwards, too. <laughs> but it is a really neat thing to do. So, But there's a lot of people that would be like, uh-uh, stay out of my, I even, I, I just heard you there. No, uh don't even think about doing that in my microwave. But think about if you had a friend that didn't care about that, or they had a microwave that was just for ivory soap experiments, you know? You never know. My husband has um, a microwave down in his garage. We just had an extra one. It's not that he's bougie. He just had an extra one. So we can go put to, use that for that, right? <laughs> no. um, but, you know, dropping the Mentos uh, in the two-liter bottle with a Diet Coke. As soon as it hits that liquid, it blows it out. Well... You know, let's do it outside, please, when it's about to rain or when it's already raining, you know. But you gather all those kind of um, experiments and things like that together so that we have everybody there. Everybody has a turn blowing something up in that thing. It was such fun. We had a great time, and we learned so much. <laughs> like how to get out of the way. Um 
Another thing you can grab a bunch of your group together is dissections. Um, you can do a lot of dissections just virtually online, and I actually prefer that, but if you are a person who just wants to do it the old-fashioned way, um, they do sell things and kits like that, and they're just anywhere you get. You can just Google it. I'm not that type of person, but I did pay somebody to do that for a few minutes. Get out of the house. Go to the library. Go for a hike. Go do school someplace else. We used to go to do school at the Chick-fil-A, and that was awesome because uh, he'd get a milkshake, I'd get a sweet tea, and they kept refilling it. Ooh. I mean, the sweet tea, not the milkshake. Um, go to a museum. We started doing field trip Fridays when it was kind of blah like this, and that was wonderful. And you don't have to actually leave the house to go on a field trip. They have virtual museums all over the place. And I know that we went to see the Vatican online. And they also have Google Moon and Google Mars, just like Google Maps. But it's on the moon and it's on Mars. It's pretty wild stuff. Check that out. Also, don't forget to include arts in your homeschool program. This was something we really struggled with, which was interesting because I'm an artist by trade, but my son is a scientist by all love and everything holy. And so we struggled to get the arts into the class. So if you see this behind me, this was a painting that we did, or he did, and it's like one of the few art things that we did in our homeschool because it just, we never really got around to doing them. But I will tell you definitely, paint, draw, create, sing, dance, act, any of that stuff is so important. And there's a lot of people that's how they express themselves. And you know, with children, a lot of times they have uh, struggles expressing themselves because they lack the vocabulary and the life experience to really articulate what they're trying to say. So, mm-hmm, let him draw a picture. Um, this also is a great way to freshen up and add color to your classroom, is to do new art on the wall. I actually uh, put new art on my wall just yesterday, and uh, it just, it looks so much cleaner and just, you know, when I get used to it looking this way, I'll have to move it around again. Um, also, window decorations. I grew up in a very rural area, and the school that I attended was built during the Depression by the uh, Civil Corps of Engineers or somebody. I don't remember exactly who it was. Probably not them, but it was built by somebody. And so the point is, it was a very old school. The windows were very thin, and when I was there in the early 80s, um, that was something that the teachers all had us do when we came back from Christmas, was to do a bunch of art so we could put them on the walls. Or, or put them on the windows. And the reason why is because it kept old man winter's bad cold breath out of the classroom. And it insulated it. But it also gave you a big pop of color. And not only that, you see the thing you did hung up there. And that just fills you with a lot of pride. You know? Especially if you feel that you did a good job on it and such. I mean, there's just something about looking over there and seeing, I did that. You know? So make sure you're doing that for your kids. And it keeps your classroom warm. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, make a play or put on a skit. A million years ago in another life, I was a Cub Scout den leader. And I've got to tell you, the skits part of Cub Scout den are my absolute most favorite. <laughs> and that's actually what I have put the link in the notes on is some Cub Scout skits that uh, was from a database I used to pull from. So go do that. And they're so cute. And it just, it creates a lot of, it's team building for your class. And you know, it's great because you have them this year but what about next year? You know, what about when they go home? And see, it's interesting because, of course, I'm talking to homeschoolers. But homeschoolers, a lot of times, they don't just have their kids. They have their part of a co-op, even if they're just in there to help, you know. So think of all these things as we're going through this. All right. Use movies and videos while bundled up under a blanket as literature. 
I did not write the rest of that out. <laughs> For literature is what I should have wrote. Go ahead and put it on your notes. For literature. Mm-hmm. Let me have a cup of tea here. Mm-mm-mm. Um, there was actually a whole book about this. I think it's called Using Movies as Literature. <laughs> really. <laughs> And it was, um, what they would do is they would have you watch a particular movie. And there were very well-known movies. Most of them we had already seen. But it would ask you questions like you would use uh, in literature uh, class. Like, you know, what is the foreshadowing? You know, uh, talk to me about the character arc. You know, that kind of stuff. And what a neat idea to do it with a story that your child already knows or your students already know. Like, for example, Star Wars. Okay, it, it's pretty hard to find a kid that hadn't seen this or even knows the lore of it. But, you know, eh, maybe that's just my generation. But, you know, you could go with Star Wars and you say, okay, do you realize in Star Wars you're cheering for the rebels? In real life, the rebels are actually the bad guys, and the military is the people that are supposed to be keeping them safe. So, you know, how would this story, how would the story of Star Wars be different if it was told from Darth Vader's point of view? Because do bad guys really actually know they're bad guys? I mean, there's a lot you can unpack right there with that, you know, just, and I encourage you to talk to your kids about stuff like that, because it's over dinner and such, you can have these wild conversations. Um, I know that at our table with our boys, uh, we have a lot of superhero conversations. It's always like, all right, Iron Man, Batman, who'd win? <laughs> Okay, um, also, PBS did a fantastic uh, series, where they've done several of them, and they're called, the, I call them the House Series, even though, whatever, but uh, that's where they would recreate a, like a setting, um, and they would put modern people back in that setting. For example, they did one where these people went back into the pioneer days, when, during the Western Expansion. Uh, and so that's called Pioneer House. Uh, they also have one that's the 1900s house, uh, the 1940s house. That one, the 1940s house is my personal favorite. They put a um, modern English family back during the Blitz in 1940. Oh, it's so good. Colonial House. Uh, that is so good, but wow. <laughs> Did that experiment just go pear-shaped real quick? And then Carrier. Okay, Carrier got some swearing. Actually, got a lot of swearing in it because uh, this is following a Navy ship, the USS Nimitz, on a deployment. So I think they bleep it out, most of it. Swearing don't bother me. So, but go forth with that. But all of these are very, very good. And they will give you, you know, it, it's, a, it's a one thing to hear about you know, colonial house and the way people live. But it's another thing to see modern people having that learning curve of realizing they got to keep the fire burning all day because they got to stay fed, uh, that they're going to go hungry if they don't soak some peas, you know, and just all of those little personal things and how they had to go to the bathroom, how they about froze to death, how their fires would go out in the middle of the night and have to learn. To, I mean, it's so good, and it really gives you a lot to talk about. So I encourage you, every one of those are good stuff. Mm. Reach out to mentor a new homeschooler. Do you know how many people start homeschooling after Christmas? Every year I'm amazed. It's just, it's like more people start homeschooling in the mid-year than they do at the beginning for some reason. It's just, or maybe I just noticed some more. I don't know. But in the homeschool uh, group that we left back in our old town, they had a mentorship program like this. And so they had a lot of great stuff. And I had no idea how spoiled we were as homeschoolers over there. But let me tell you, this is what some of the things, just some of the things that that homeschool group provided. Okay. 
reach out to mentor a new homeschooler because you remember what it was like when you first got started. I mean, even now, I'm like, I think I've screwed them up completely. Yeah, you have. Don't worry about it. This kid's going to put me in therapy. You probably need to go anyway. Don't even worry about it. At least you and your therapist to have some good gossip. <laughs> this kid to draw me crazy. I've been here with you. Oh, me. But remember what it was like when you first started homeschooling. What did you need to hear? What can you do to offer that new homeschooler in this community? Hmm. Um, our homeschool group also, if you are in that kind of swimming in those waters, some other things that homeschool parents need. And if you are a member of a homeschool group or you just want to you know, start your own. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, get some like-minded people together. Your kids get along. There's your homeschool group. You don't have to have a proper, you know, card member from so-and-so whatever group. You don't have to do it. You can go do your own thing. But here are some things that we need. Take notes if you're running a homeschool group. Mentorship, yes. We also need a curriculum night where you get together with all of your uh, with everybody in your group and they bring one thing that they love in their homeschool program and they have got 2 minutes to tell you why they love it next thing that's so helpful mothers night out oh my gosh this is so so great and so so essential because <sighs> these kids done drove us crazy and you don't have it at somebody's house. No. You have it at a restaurant so you can have an adult beverage. I don't drink, but that's a big deal breaker for some people. Um, find a good homeschool group or simply start one. Because, you know, <laughs> put the new homeschoolers with the veteran homeschoolers so that they can help them. Put the high schoolers with people who have graduated their children. I don't understand. Yeah. Have story time with the younger children being read to by the older children. We did that every time our homeschool group got together, and it was the most beautiful thing. And they would go when they get together, and they would have books that they're so prepared to read. And the older kids got more excited about it than the younger kids because they remembered when they were being read to by the older kids. And it's a beautiful, great thing. Definitely do it. And... Have a game night for your group. Holy smoke, we're almost done. Look at this. Have a game night for your group. In particular, uh, new games. And also encourage the kids to make their own games. There's nothing that says you can't do that. <gasps> free table and free box night. Okay. In our homeschool group that we have here in uh, West Georgia, they introduced me to a concept called the free table. That was the neatest, coolest crap. What you did is whenever you got together for any kind of co-op, or this one particular co-op in particular, they would take and put a table out, and everybody brought anything they just didn't want anymore, but they didn't want to take it to the thrift store, and they brought it and put it on that table. And so you would find the coolest stuff on there. Holy smoke, and they just wanted to get it going. At the end of the day, when everybody left, they needed to be somebody that would take the leftovers to the thrift store and drop them off and put the table up. It's amazing. Adopt it. It helps with recycling. It helps people with stuff that they need. And it helps keep stuff out of the landfill. Come on. Why aren't you doing it? Uh, free box night. We did this at the homeschool group that we left on the other side of Atlanta. And that's where everybody got together and they had a box of stuff that they wanted to take to the thrift store. But they just couldn't be bothered to do it. So everybody went to the homes or the, they went to, you know, the co-op meeting, whatever. And so they sat the box down and everybody went through the boxes. And there and again, somebody needs to uh, volunteer to take everything uh, to the thrift store that people didn't want, but it was a great way to keep things out of the landfill, to recycle and to get curriculum and books and stuff like that out of your house and into hands that they needed to be in. It's perfect. Um, messy mentors. This was another thing our homeschool group did. And it's kind of in that same vein with um, you're homeschooling, but you don't want to make a mess in your house. Well, sometimes you need a messy mentor. 
I was a messy mentor because it didn't bother me to get dirty. I'm an artist. I'd go paint. I'd go spray painting, you know. I'd blow stuff up. Whatever we want to do, you know. I'll go crawl in the woods with you. I'll teach you how to build a shelter. You know, might make moonshine, you know. <laughs> Whatever needs to be done. And, but it seems like kids that love to do that are children of parents who don't want to get their finger nut, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that because, um... There just isn't anything wrong with that. So we would have the kids come over and we would do a big painting thing and we'd get messy with our messy mentors. It was a lot of fun. Um, we also had a bicycle roundup group and this was such fun. The kids would get together on their bicycles and we'd meet at a park and they would put all kinds of glowing stuff on their bicycles so that you could really see them all the time. But it also was just so much fun for the kids. And it got them off the, off the computer and moving and riding. So, yes, glow it up. And, of course, soccer club. Soccer club for us started at a public park where we just all got together and we divided the kids out. And the people, the grown-ups played the kids, you know, in soccer. And then as we got more people, we ended up moving into an indoor soccer gym. And that was wonderful and great and Ooh, them kids need to run at them. Mm, they need to run at them runnies. <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> kids, they need to run that off, man. But if nothing else, remember with your burnout moment that this is normal. And I use that word very loosely. Normal to me is a setting on a dishwasher. But it's normal to feel bleh this time of year. Absolutely it is. Um, but remember... Homeschooling does not mean that you're recreating the experience that you had in school. Um, it just simply means you're tutoring your child. And, you know, teaching your child something they're not interested in learning is the same thing as throwing uh, marshmallows at the side of their head and calling it eating. I mean, 99% of all learning has to be the child wants to do it. Now, there's a whole other subject with that of what happens if my child just don't want to do it. Excuse me, we'll get into that another time. But today, I hope I have given you something that you can find useful. And you can download Dylan with Burnout, Mama Wolf's Cheat Sheet, down below. And tell me, though, how do you deal with burnout? Tell me, uh, down below. And uh, if you like this video, you want to see more like it, Subscribe, and uh, what other things do we need to talk about? All right, thank you for attending my lecture, and I will see you soon.